Sí. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Those of you watching by internet, good morning. It's great to be with you guys this morning. The Word of God says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Serena, wonderful job bringing that out. How did you know that's what I was going to talk about today? You just, just hit it right on. So, again, I just want to say that the Lord Jesus wants to change everybody's life today. How about that? You showed up today for a reason to hear God's voice, and worship brought us into that place. I love it so much. And I just want to share a little bit. Those of you who don't know me, I want to share a little bit about myself with you, um, just to get a little bit of perspective of that and where I've come from. So anyway, before I do that, turn in your Bible if you've got one. We'll get that started. We're going to get to that in a little while. Turn to the book of James, chapter 1. If you have an app or you have your Bible, just start to get there. So let me tell you a little bit about me. I'm going to share a little bit about that. I'm a believer in Jesus who's been rescued from a life of despair and failure. <laughs> and I've been transformed by the unconditional love of Christ. How about you? He has the ability to change us from the inside out. And now he's made me into a lover of people who gets an opportunity to rescue people where they are help them discover, unlock, and release the God-given potential he's put inside of them. And it's such an honor and such a privilege to do that. So I'm learning more and more that I'm an ambassador of, of Jesus, and I'm a representative of who he is. And he's poured inside of me this con uncontrollable love that he wants to pass out to other people. So I have the privilege of publicly honoring him by working at Casa Trinity, I don't know if you know that is. It's a substance use and alcohol use clinic outpatient facility. I work with about 35 people that are, that are uh, on the team. And I have personally about 55 clients that I personally work with. And I have the opportunity to, to pour the love of Jesus into them. And I also leave, lead five group therapies. So I, I lead the men's track. So I have an opportunity to share the love of God with men. And men are many times are broken by alcohol or substance use. And women too, but we have a preponderance of more guys that are there. So anyway, um, many of the people that we meet there are angry. When I first meet a client, a lot of times they come in with anger as a result of having to be there because of the legal system. And they have difficulties not dealing with the law people very well and don't like to, like to be told what to do. Who does? Anybody? <laughs> so, and when you're in the system, sometimes you just don't want, don't want to be in the system. And everybody who represents authority is somebody you don't want to be around. So a lot of the people, though, I also work with are self-referred there, which means ultimately that they've chosen to come there on their own, which is a way different perspective than if somebody tells you you have to do something. How about you? <laughs> you have a choice to do something and you choose to do it. It's something that makes a big difference in your life and you make a difference that way. Um, other people have a lot of identity issues. Anybody have any identity issues in your life ever? <laughs> so, okay. Um, and some of them say to me, I don't really know what I want to be when I grow up. As adults. So if you feel that way this morning, you don't know what you want to be when you grow up, don't be so surprised by that. <laughs> because sometimes we don't have a sense of direction. You don't have a sense of purpose. We don't know uh, who we are yet. And that's largely discovered as we come to know Jesus in a better way, in a new way. So many of the people that I work with have emotional issues. Again, these are all things everyone here can relate to, <laughs> one way or the other. But again, when you add addiction in there and you add substance abuse, when people try to pour over their life, uh, and they deal with, I guess I would say, they don't want to feel anything. And so they use substances instead because the pain is so deep. Again, some of you may understand that. We've all experienced pain. And many of them don't believe in God. They don't have any sense of who he is, and so their belief system is a bit skewed and they're disconnected. Um, we've all been that way at one time or another. And they tend to blame God sometimes. 
for how he's made them and what's going on in their life. So, and also they could beat themselves up. Anybody ever do that? <laughs> We're our own worst enemies aren't, sometimes, aren't we? And our self-talk is often negative. About 80% of what people say to themselves is usually negative. And as a believer in Jesus, we have the opportunity to turn that around and have a better identity, a different perspective of who we really are. So when a person doesn't believe in God, what does that do? The, the construct of their life, their belief system, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, and I used the whiteboard to share with a few things with you, don't, we don't get a good perspective of who we are because we believe a lie about who God has made us. And we don't even, if we don't include God in that, what do we do? So a lot of folks have also constructed their own belief system. Isn't that what we do? We grow up and we construct in our own mind what life is really like and how we're perceived in the world and what we're supposed to do. And we get, we get a sense from our experience what life is. And sometimes that experience isn't always positive. And so we wander. We don't know exactly where we're going. A lot of folks are not really used to being loved unconditionally. And when somebody says, and I, and I tell my groups all the time, guys, and it takes a little while for them to get this, but I let them know I love them. And many of them may not have heard that for a long time, if ever. Some of us is, have probably come from families where I love you is not a normal expression in the family. Have you? And so what do we get? We get a warped perspective of what love is. Or we may not have modeled, seen it modeled correctly. I have the opportunity to be kind of like a horse whisperer, is what I like to say to people. Because so often people are hurt so badly, I start by offering them an apple or a sugar cube. <laughs> you know? And at first it's backing away from that because... I don't trust you. I don't like the smell of you. <laughs> you know, that's the, nat the natural approach that people have. And when, when you've been like that, and you're ang an angry animal, so to speak, why would you trust anybody, especially them approaching you? We don't. We just don't. So I try to extend, as I said, my personal, this personal extension of myself. And also, I try to lead by vulnerability. How many of you like to be vulnerable? Anybody? Hello. I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning that vulnerability is what changes people's lives. Why should I expect you to tell me anything about you if I'm not willing to tell, my, tell you about myself? I'm the professional therapist. Shut up. <laughs> who, who cares? You know, who cares what you, what you know? Nobody really does. <laughs> You like that, I'm glad. <laughs> really, and that's, I get a lot of that. <laughs> when people first come in, because of the anger, because of the, I guess I would say, the misunderstanding they've had, and the sense of a lack of understanding of why people care about them, or why would they? People often will continue that behavior, and they'll test you little by little to see if you really care, by giving you a little piece of themselves, and if we don't, handle that very well, they're not going to ever open up again. And so, their world, world view of people like that, me too, is jaundiced. It's broken, as we said a couple weeks ago. And when we live inside the system of, of I would say, the living with adults who have problems, who are in and out of jail a lot, and this is the population, the people that I love, I get an opportunity to work with. They don't have emotional regulation. They don't have the ability many times to stop the anger because there's so much pain there. And they feel everything is an attack. Ever felt like that? Sure. So, if I continue to believe that God doesn't care about me, or I don't even believe in God, or that there is a God, that I'm agnostic, or... God has always let me down. That's the way I'm going to perceive my life, that there is not a God, and I'm going to live my life like that. Why would I believe in him anyway? 
So if you feel that anger today, if you feel that sense of shame, or a lot of the people like I work with feel shame, what are we ashamed of anyway? What is it that holds us back? What is it that shows us that part of ourself that tells us that we, we are worthless? We're no, of no value. And I think it's just the enemy's voice that continues to drive us into the ground and tries to pulverize us to be nothing. I, I don't know if you've seen a, a love-starved puppy. We see those commercials on TV, don't we? A love-starved uh, puppy that has got its tail between its legs. It's just it's getting ready to be kicked the next time, especially the sheltered ones, the ones that have been in animal prison, the shelters, right? They don't know. And when you see them, they're, they're, a lot of times they're shaking. How many of you have seen them? A puppy just, just shakes, it's so afraid. And those, we're a little, we're adult in here, though. We don't necessarily show shaking, but, you know, we're sophisticated. But we may show it by our emotional outbursts. We may show it through our anger, through our sorrow, uh, through our pain. And so I, I find that one of the things I get an opportunity to do is listen. And just watch. <laughs> Not be in a rush. Slow it down. And as I ask questions, little by little, and listen to what they're saying, not to what I think they should know, but to who they really are, I get a sense of who they are. And little by little, they begin to trust. And little by little, surprisingly, people may actually say to me, I've never told anyone this before, but and that doesn't happen in a minute. I've had some of the clients I've worked with for years now, I've been there about six years now at Trinity. And people are just needing to be loved and don't know how to receive it. So I'm just wondering if anybody here has experienced trials and the difficulties, although you may not have been in jail or prison, that you may have, and you're welcome. I lived, I was homeless for two years, living in the rescue mission in Syracuse. So, something you didn't know about me. Life goes on, you know. When your life is broken and you're living among street people and getting your clothes from the rescue mission, as I did, until God rescued me. Living with folks that are considered by others to be the dregs of the earth, pedophiles, street people, People who pick up cigarette butts when there's one or two hits left on the cigarette because they don't have the money to buy anything for themselves. God puts us back together, you guys. He has an ability to rescue us, and then he, he sends us back to the very people that we were. And there's no judgment there, is there? There's no place of... Well, I've got, I'm better than you. There's no talking down to anyone. There's no condescension. Because having been there, lower than a worm's belly, as I like to say, nowhere, from, nowhere but up from there, right? <laughs> and I think, I think it's God's intention, really, to break us all. Because he wants to break us and mend us and then help us be menders of other people. That's who he is. That's, didn't Jesus do the same? Didn't he demonstrate and pour his life out? And wasn't, wasn't he willing to be afflicted? I'm just thinking of Isaiah 53 right now. How the, the passage, you familiar with the passage? I'm going to read it real quick. Put my Bible up here. I thought I might need it. Huh. I'm going to just read a, a part, part of this. You never, may never have heard this. This, has been, this was written about 2,000 years before Jesus was born. See if you can hear in this 
a reflection of God's intention of recognizing that one day Jesus would come and people would say, who is this anyway? And listen to this just a bit. And we'll get to the James 1 in a minute. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten of God, afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. That's what God puts us through too. It's called the way of the cross. And we get to go the way of the cross ourselves to help other people who are, who are also going through difficulties. The chastising of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has called the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep that's silent before its shearers, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And, after, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of the people to whom the stroke was due? That's us. <laughs> the transgression of the people to whom the stroke was due. He took all of those strokes on himself for us. So the beauty is to be able to be a rescuer wherever we are, to be able to realize that the difficulties we've, we've gone through, as we shared so well in worship this morning about the joy of God and how God takes the sorrows and the difficulties of our life and he pours us out, that's God's intention. So I've learned that the trials of life are God's primary way to develop his character in us. Do you like trials? Scott did such a magnificent job last week talking about pain and, and how God brings us through the process. What It was magnificent to me. And it was really, I, I love how he shares from his heart like that. And understand that to talk about pain for a few weeks in a row is not necessarily fun. I'm like, okay, I get to talk about pain again. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, that's the nature of things. Because we don't get over pain in a week. It takes time to process it. And you may not have been here for other messages in this series. And again, if you haven't been and you're here watching by internet today, you may, this may be the first time you're tuning in. And if you're here for the first time again, you may be going through some personal pain yourself. And God's intention is to bring healing to you. That's what he wants to do. So I've realized a few things. That, that trials have lots of faces. They have, it has the face of temptation. How many of you have been tempted? For sure, right? That's a trial. How many of us have been persecuted? And how many of us have been had, having adversity of some type in our life? We do. And all those things God uses for his character, or for the developing of character in us. So now, finally, James chapter 1. You got your Bible or your Bible app? All right. This is a, a tremendous passage, I hope, by the grace of God, to be able to bring it, bring it to life today a little bit. Here's what he says. I'm using the New American Standard translation. He says this, Consider it joy. How about that? when you encounter various trials. Let me say that again. Why don't you say it? Consider it joy. <laughs> say it like you mean it. Consider it joy when you encounter various trials. All right, now there's a perspective for you. Let's start to look at this. God says the way we look at trials makes a big difference. If I look at my trial as, oh, what's the matter with me? What's the matter with God? He doesn't really care about me then he wants to teach us some things because our worldview needs to be changed a little bit. It needs to be turned right side up, I guess, to see him and to see his purpose and to see what he has for us. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. 
Let's look at the progression for just a bit. He says, consider it joy when you, consider, when you have trials. Why? Because the testing of your, pay, your faith is supposed to produce something. I'm not saying that it feels good. I didn't say that. and I, wasn't, I didn't write that, right? <laughs> but again, when we look back at Isaiah 53, and we see what Jesus endured for us, the Word of God says, for the joy set before him, who was the joy? What was that? Us. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross and the shame and all of it because he had us in mind. Even way back before the beginning of time, Isaiah 53, written 2,000 years before Jesus even came, right? About who he was and what he would come to do and what he already did. And you and I are included in that op opportunity to be able to live out this life of trials. Just say this with me. <laughs> Sorry. I love trials. Just say it again like you mean it. Are you lying to me right now? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Think about this. Embracing, learning to embrace the difficulties of life. You know, some of, us, some of us are in pain every day. Physical pain, right? Those of you who are younger who got life by the tail still and you're all, you're all that and you're all buff and all that. That's a guy. <laughs> who said that? Anyway, the, there's, that's one type of pain. What about emotional pain? I would like to suggest that emotional pain is more difficult to heal from than physical pain. And we don't always appreciate the fact that a broken leg, we stay off it, don't we? <laughs> stay off it. What are you doing? I was talking to somebody the other day. They had, they had knee surgery, and they were walking on it. And it was lo the, the cast was, was loose. I said, why didn't, why didn't you get crutches? Oh, I had a walking cast. I'm like, well, I don't think so. <laughs> Again, take your emotional pain and, and just try walking on it, limping through life a little bit. Why not give it time to heal? And sometimes people do need counsel. They need the counsel of God. They need other people in their lives to help them. And that's okay. Don't be ashamed of that. I needed, I did, oh my goodness, I did a lot of group therapy. <laughs> a lot of individual therapy. <laughs> to help me through, and it's made me a better counselor because I know what it's like to be on the receiving end. When I first went to group therapy, I said absolutely nothing, and I planned on saying absolutely nothing to anyone because you don't care anyway. You don't know me. Why would I tell you anything anyway about me? Why would I do that? But little by little as I showed up, Someone said 80% of the battle is showing up. Just keep showing up. Just keep showing up. Just keep coming. Don't quit. Don't give up on yourself or God or your circumstances or your family. Okay, family's family. They, we have family. <laughs> so, but the fact that the reality is Today is today, and a thousand years to God is one day, and he can take the moments in your family history and your current family situation, and somehow he can just break through that when he's ready to do it. And sometimes he has to process us, doesn't he, through this stuff. And he doesn't consult us, you know? He doesn't ask our permission before he says, okay, he doesn't say, are you ready for a trial? No, it's like, are you... In the, in the boat, the disciples were not given the opportunity, were they, to say, okay, let's, let's go through the storm. You ready? It's going to be a big one. And you guys are fishermen. I know it. I know you know it's what it's like to be out here. But when you're out there and they've, they're in a storm they've never been in before, and it's bigger than they could ever experience before, and, and they're used to being on the sea all the time. Oh, well. How about you? Have you had a big one? A big trial? How about, you know, near-death experiences some of us have had, right? Y'all? Uh, again, working with addicted people, 
Many of them have had multiple overdoses. Again, I feel for them. And every overdose is considered a suicide attempt, by the way, um, is how we handle it. Because we don't know that that person may have been trying to off themselves and somebody just happened to Narcan them back. Like, you know? And again, it's, that's, to be able to rescue people from something like that, to see someone turn blue and then see them come back to life is pretty hair-raising experience. And to be able to be that in, that in that trench at the moment and be able to love on them when they come back to life and maybe they didn't want to come back to life. So oftentimes people, when they come back from that, are Narcan, if you know what that is, it doesn't matter. It's put it near someone's nose and it, it takes the, the opiate effect away. But to realize that that person may be angry when they wake up because they didn't necessarily want to be back, to have that kind of pain. And if you're in that kind of pain or you've had that kind of pain, then usually people don't talk about it. When they have a plan, they don't talk about it. And so our, my role and my hope is to be able to love people right where they are and probably try to see the signs of difficulty. And we all have them. We've all had moments, haven't we? We felt all alone. We felt like God's promises aren't really true. That he really doesn't care. And he, but, he, that he, but he does want to bring us through the difficulties that we go through. It's just what it, what it is. You know, he says that, though, yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death. He doesn't say, I'm going to live there. Or die there. Um, so, I believe God's faithful. How about you? That's something to, to look at. Is What if God says it? We just read about it. Consider it my joy. Or consider it joy. Let the endurance have its perfect result. That you may per be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That God has got a purpose to bring us through the process so that we be perfect and complete. It's an amazing thing. So, you know, you may be sitting in this room this morning and you may have come with family, maybe a young person or an older person, but you may feel alone even though you're, there are people around you. Even though you may have come with friends or family members, sometimes we feel alone. We don't feel connected. And I think the one thing people need most, some, we, had a, we had a group the other day, and I, the question I asked the guys was, what do you value most? And two-thirds of the guys said family. A lot of them are estranged from family, and they're trying to earn, I guess I could say, the, the trust back that's been broken. And I, I just said, my answer was, and I get, they get to ask me what I, what I feel too. I, I don't, I'm part of the group. I'm not just out, sta out here doing something. I, I told them that the most important, the thing I value most is connection. My connection with God my connection with other people, and my connection with myself. Because if I'm disconnected with God, I'm in trouble <laughs> because I get disconnected with myself real quick and I, get, disconnect, I dis, get disconnected from other people and I start isolating. It's not healthy for me. How about you? I want to read a quote to you that was written by Matthew Henry many years ago that I hope you can appreciate. He said this, when we bear all that God appoints and as long as he appoints and with a humble, obedient eye to him and when we not only bear troubles but rejoice in them, then endurance has its perfect work. God, how long is this trial going to last? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> God ain't talking. <laughs> A lot of times he doesn't. He sees if we're going to trust in him. He sees if we're going to look to him to be the one who meets our needs. And we need him to be. I have taken the liberty to paraphrase the passage from James chapter 1 by compar comparing and bringing together a lot of translations plus a little bit of Manny translation. 
So this is, the, this is James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, a little bit more extended. Dear friends, is your life full of difficulties and, tenta- and, and temptation? Then be supremely happy. See it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. Don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize they have come to test your faith to produce in you the quality of endurance, perseverance, and patience. For when your way is rough, your patience has a chance to grow. So let it grow, and don't try to squirm out of your problems. That's the Living Bible. For when, <laughs> for when your patience and your life, like the apple tree we talked about last time, is finally in full bloom and fruitful, then you'll be ready for anything. Strong in character, full of patience, a person of integrity, complete and mature. This last part is from the, the Passion Translation. Then as your endurance grows even stronger, it will release perfection, God's glory, into every part of your being until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I came across an illustration that I've been using with the men and with my individual clients over the last little while, and it's called Kintsukuri. Have you ever heard of it? Kintsukuri. You go ahead and run run that, if you please. I'm going to read this to you. Tim Alderman tells the story of Kintsukuri, which is, which means golden mend. It's a Japanese art term for mending broken pottery using lacquer resin laced with gold or silver. As well as a, as a nifty form of repair, it has a deeper philosophical significance. The mended flaws become part of the object's design, and some people believe the pottery to be even more beautiful, having gone through the process of being broken and repaired. Through Kintsukuri, the cracks and seams are merely a symbol of an event that happened in the life of the object rather than the cause of its destruction. Like pots, bowls, cups, and plates, we endure our own bumps and scrapes. We experience drops from a dizzying height and unexpected knocks. Sometimes we experience things that plant the seeds of shame, rejection, betrayal, abandonment, and failure. So we try to avoid experiences that leave us vulnerable to these feelings as much as possible, lest the people around us see the evidence of just how imperfect and flawed and not good enough we really are. In other words, we stay hidden in the cupboard behind the best silver because we don't want to get a chip or a crack or completely break. That's not to say that trauma or tragedy automatically makes us more beautiful. Some people have dealt with those things and come out on the other side as ugly as it gets. These experiences do change us, though, and we have a choice, Tim says. We can choose to reject our bitter experiences and flaws, to wish and will them away, to regret to pine, and to live in the land of if only. We can disguise with false self-personas, cover up with defenses, and distract with busyness. Or we can expect these experiences for what they are, or accept these experiences for what they are, our golden seams. The times when we get scratched, chipped, cracked, and broken can feel terribly and terrible, can feel terrible, but there can also be a strange beauty in the way we process them and in the lessons we take from them afterwards, if we want. Our experiences don't define us, but they do influence us. We can decide or hide, or we can decide to embrace these experiences that have shaped us in some small way, the experience to which we've also applied our own special coating of gold lace resin. 
we can decide to cover up or we can decide to walk out into the world as ourselves, mended and broken and all. Your story is told. Your story is yours to, to, to tell. Embrace the experiences that have influenced you. Isn't that something? Love it so much. I, I think the pots look gorgeous, don't they? There's another amazing passage of scripture. There's a couple I want to share with you that are in this vein. You can turn if you want, but I'm just going to read them to you. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 11. This really relates to the picture you were seeing. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Some call them cracked pots. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus. You know, that passage, always, I was always wondering what that meant. And this illustration has helped me understand that the brokenness in our own lives as God puts us back together, we get to carry in our own body the dying of Jesus. The brokenness that he felt, we get to carry that in our own body because of the experiences we've had. Always carrying about in the, in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we, for we who live are constantly delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. I found myself that the, the experiences, the death experiences of my life bring death to my flesh and to my, to my own feeling for myself and bring me closer to God and gives me the opportunity to pour my life out to other people who are going through death and going through difficult experiences. Here's another one, amazing passage. That I may know him. Philippians 3, 10 through 14. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Being conformed to his death. In order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect. But I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which Christ laid hold of me. I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amazing. The word of God is so amazing, so timely, so real. I wonder if you just take a moment and bow your heads with me and maybe make an altar right where you are, whether you're here or watching online. And just kind of want to ask you a couple questions. Have you ever considered that the way you respond to trials is the way you respond to God? And could you agree with me before God that a couple of things maybe need to be adjusted? Could you agree that as difficult as things may be, God uses your trials as his primary way to develop his character in you and manifest his glory through you? Could you agree with me that he knows what he's doing even when you don't think so. Maybe you could just take a moment and whisper your trial or trials back to God, right where you are. Name them. Lay them on the altar. And would you be willing to reaffirm with me 
your trust in God? And would you be able to say, maybe out loud with me, Jesus, I trust you. I trust you. I trust that you have my best intentions in mind. I thank you that you're always faithful to me. You always keep your promises. And lastly, could you thank the Lord for the trial and ask him to use it to produce joy in your life? As difficult as that may seem right now. Lord, even in the overwhelming fires of the hardest trials we have, we declare you're faithful. We declare we trust in you. Because you're so amazing to us. You're rescuing us. You're mending us from the inside out. Holy Spirit, come. Have your way in this place. In every heart that's broken. Every life that needs mending. Help us to see the golden seams that you are using in our lives to put us back together more beautifully than we could ever be ourselves. We couldn't have figured it out. We didn't plan it. But somehow you're able to use everything and work everything together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. You know, you may be here this morning and you may have never surrendered your life to Jesus. And maybe this morning you're even more aware than you have been before that, yeah, trials come and it's been a tough road. Maybe you're ready today in this moment to raise the white flag up the pole and surrender. Open the door of the fort that you built around yourself to protect yourself from everything that's happened. But instead, maybe today, you open the door. Just a crack. Enough for him to come in. In the book of Revelation, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And I will dine with him or her and and them with me. All I need to do is ask. That's all you need to do. He promises that he'll come in. He promises. All you need to do is take him at his word see them. If you're a believer this morning, I'm going to ask you as well to simply surrender to him. If you'd like to, raise your hands as a, maybe like palms up as a form of surrender just to, at your altar right where you are right now, just give yourself to him. Can you say, Lord Jesus, thank you that you're making me into a beautiful work of art that is displaying your goodness and glory that demonstrates how perfect you are and how you can take us and mold us and make us into a vessel of honor useful for you and for your purpose. Thank you for each person here, God. Thank you for each person that's in the sound of my voice right now that you know everything about us. From the beginning of time, you created us and you saw us. And you're taking even those things that have been difficult and using them now and pouring us back out to people just like us that can relate to someone just like us. So be exalted, we pray. 
Thank you for this moment. In Jesus' name, everyone said.